Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to a very special site indeed. What a way to spend an afternoon. I was about to say, I think it's Thursday, isn't it? What a way to spend a Thursday afternoon. Couldn't remember the day for a second. Quick introduction, my name is Jamie. This afternoon, Batman, or Craig, is on the back behind the camera. He's the one who spotted the cheetah in the first place. What a spectacular way to start. We're live from Juma Private Game Reserve, which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. And because this is a live safari, that means send through your questions on hashtag safari live on Twitter. Alternatively, you can do that in the YouTube comments stream. So what does Juma mean? Juma means the sound that a lion makes or is the descriptive description in the local language of the sound that a lion makes. In this case, though, we're not sitting with lions. We are sitting with the smallest of the big cats, not one, but a two cheetah one of which is actually flat behind a tree, so we can't really see it. We can just see its bottom over there. Two young male cheetah who are striking out on their own for the very first time. Now, I mentioned that I mentioned during the school drive, but I didn't want to go into too much detail, that we suspect that their mother hasn't survived. I actually got that information from Tristan, so if you want more details on that, you'll have to ask him. Apparently, Hyenas were found eating a cheetah in that area. Apparently they went all the way back towards Thorny Bush. I apologize, I don't have the full details. I should have asked him when he told me, but I was so de sort of devastated by the thought that their mother might no longer be with us. She was the cheetah with the short tail and a blind eye, and I only ever got to see her once. I think some of the other guides out here, Tristan, for example, and Taylor, got to spend a bit more time with them because they were they were on Juma quite a bit while I was in the Mara, but I only got one opportunity to see them. And these boys are so hungry. They're they're at an age where they they could easily survive their mother's absence. You know, we could think positively and think that perhaps she's just decided it's time for them to be on their own. Malika's boys were around about this age when she disappeared and they were absolutely fine. So these boys just have to learn a little bit. Shame. They they really messed up that impala hunt earlier. I mean, it wasn't even... It, there was not a chance. Those impala already knew. They'd already seen them coming down the road towards them. So all that was essentially was a bit of wasted energy by that one. His brother seems a bit more sensible though. So hopefully he'll be the one who makes those hunting decisions because he just stood there. How fantastic were those calls though? Right up next to us. Such a rare opportunity. Are oh, you hot boys? It is hot. It is very sweaty this afternoon, humid. Okay, I'm going to take an enormous breath because it's been on the go, on the go, from when we first saw them. So while we do that, let's send you across to James, who is taking in the scenery of the magnificent Masai Mara. Those cheetahs are, or most cheetahs, of course, are unlike the other predators we see in that they don't stick to roads, ever. And at Juma, that can be deeply, deeply troubling from a driving point of view, and I'm sure Jamie will have a welcome respite. Right, we're supposed to be looking at a rainbow there. I'm not sure if you can see it. Can you see it? I am looking at my monitor, but there's a bit of a glare on it. You should be able to see it. We haven't had any luck with the Sausage Tree Pride, and we are in the area that David Gathamba Githu calls the Sausage Tree Republic. And I suppose one of the reasons we're not finding them is that there's no sun, which means that they're not having to take refuge in the little bit of shade that there is here. Anyway, we will continue to do our best to find them. We have our little TV rehearsal this evening, and it'd be nice to have those lions for the rehearsal and for the actual show. It doesn't look like it's supposed to be raining, but it has been raining on us from time to time, just a bit of spit and that sort of thing, so it hasn't been particularly bad, but we haven't managed to find any lions. And in fact, if you look at these plains, eh, there's not a lot of here for lions to eat. Please continue to talk to us, of course, using the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter, otherwise you can use the chat stream on YouTube. 
can send us your questions and your comments. And it's very nice, of course, to have three of us out this afternoon, as opposed to just me waffling at you like it was this morning. And Isaac, of course, who didn't waffle, he gave some fascinating information, including that of a little, slightly apricot-coloured flower. D. Sinak, I would love to do some birding. The only bird I've seen is one cesticular, sort of about seven miles that way. But if we find any birds, Sinak, fear not. We will bird. We will bird like mad. We've done some good primates this afternoon, I suppose. That's good. And Kimberly, I'm afraid we are miles and miles and miles from the bat-eared fox den in our attempt to find the Sausage Tree Pride. But I haven't been to the bat at Fox Den. I must do that while I'm here. I would like to do that. Maybe we can get Isaac to go there tomorrow morning. He'll be driving in the morning. But at the moment, it's looking a little dry on the lion side. It still continues to be magnificent to be here. Oh, thank you. Mike, you say you like my new hat. That's very kind of you. It was bought, I think Lauren bought about 35 of them out from Scotland because we cannot find hats like this in South Africa. Kirsten got me one in uh, Hong Kong, a decent green colored hat. That was great. Uh, but other than that, they're actually very difficult to find. And so Lauren found a shop in Scotland that makes these hats, and so she brought a whole lot out for us, which was very kind. And that is what I'm wearing. It fits me head quite well. Uh, my brain is very small though, so you can see that I've had to tighten it slightly in order to accommodate my small skull. Ah, there is a bird, a little spotted bungay. Stop, bird, don't fly. There we have the secretary bird. Isn't that nice? And let us never ever forget that the secretary bird is not called a secretary bird because of the feathers in the head, which are supposed to look like secretaries, uh, pens, all the knickerbockers it's wearing. It is in fact called the secretary bird from the word secretary, which is Arabic for hunter. I've no doubt I have completely butchered the pronunciation of that word. In Arabic, I don't speak very good Arabic. Do you, Bungay? No, no, neither of us speak very good Arabic, neither of us speak any Arabic at all. Anyway, that's where it gets its name from. And it is hunting snakes and the like. Now, Bungay, I don't know if you can see that vehicle driving away up that road. I suspect it is going to have to escape the reserve fairly soon. But I also wonder if it hasn't come from where the lions are. So I think that instead of turning right along that road, we should turn left. What do you say? Uh, maybe. maybe. Bunge, I feel that you're lacking faith in me today. I do not feel confident in your faith in me today, Bunge. <laughs> you're making me feel feel lack of confidence. Anyway, we'll keep trying. I've never actually seen these things catch a snake, but I really would like to. There was that amazing sighting, who was it that had it? Was it Tristan or Steve? Where it wouldn't kill the snake, and it kept carrying it around, and then dropping it and feeding on something else, and picking its pet snake up, and then carrying it around, and then... I don't know, I don't remember who it was. I think it was Tristan or Steve, somewhere here in the Mara. Very cruel for the little reptile. I know many people struggle to think of... Uh, sort of a, uh, a cruelty to snakes, but many of you, of course, will love them as much as we do. I had to catch a snake on holiday, believe it or not. It was a large puff adder, which I caught with a putter. Rosalind, before I answer your question, I'm following with my eyes and my binoculars a hornbill. Can you see it there, Bungay? And it's carrying something. Hornbills are not common here. And it's not a crowned hornbill, which I've seen here often before. Well spotted, Bungay. That's fantastic. 
Wow. Okay, let's see if we can find which hornbill it was. I didn't get a great look. They wanted to do some birding, Cenac. Birding you have. Did it go into that tree? Yep. I suspect it has a nest in that tree. Right, let's have a look. Oh, well, it's not particularly exciting, I'm afraid. Uh, it is, I think it was an African grey hornbill, which of course we get at Juma as common as you like. That's, I thought that's what it was when I saw it, but I've never seen one here before. I probably, no, I have seen one here before, actually. So, grey hornbill probably has a nest in that tree there. Very good. Hmm. Okay, let's carry on. We've had a secretary bird and a grey hornbill. And now we will try and find where that vehicle came from and perhaps it will lead us to the lions. Despite Bungay's lack of uh, confidence. Yes, Jamie Patterson, uh, my snake catching skills were better than the last time at Juma. So, I don't know if any... Did we tell you the story, everybody? Brent and I caught a puff adder in the garages the other day at Juma. It was embarrassing, to say the least. We were not very competent. The snake looked more, more than irritated at our presence, more astounded at our incompetence than anything else. We don't have snake tongs, you see, so we used a rake and a stick. Now, a puff adder you can catch relatively easily if you get it in the right place, because they're quite slow. I mean, they can move around a bit, but if you hook them up in the middle of their bodies, they're quite easy to pick up. That's why I had a putter to do it with me this time. So Brent and I were utterly hopeless the other day, but uh, after one failed attempt at the snake in uh, the Eastern Cape, it was a prickly sluggish female. I think she'd just eaten, and I think she was about to lay eggs as well. Not lay eggs, she would have given birth. But um, I just hooked the putter underneath her midriff and picked her up, and then she struggled to move. We put her in a bucket and carried her off to the bush. So, <laughs> yes, Jamie, it was far better, but I did learn from that experience uh, with Brent, where the two of us uh, did not exactly look like world-class snake wranglers. No, child of the universe, none of us are qualified to teach anybody anything about snake catching. Well, but for the real basics. So no, we don't teach the new guys how to catch snakes. Uh, I, if, for example, for something like a black mamba. If I find a mamba in an area, we'd call an expert to take it out. I wouldn't try and take a mamba out. I've caught cobras before. And so if we had proper snake tongs, which we do, I would uh, catch a cobra. But other than that, you've got to be very, very careful. And if you're not a qualified snake wrangler, you shouldn't be teaching people to wrangle snakes. Puff adder, relatively easy to catch, like I say. And a cobra, well, it's kind of next level up. They're relatively slow, you see. But the spitting ones, you obviously don't want to be spat in the eye by. Righty, we're heading into some glorious sunshine now. Let's go back to Jamie, who's sitting with two glorious cats. Well, I mean, we're not teaching the, the trainees how to catch snakes, but um, we're certainly teaching them how not to in certain circumstances. I shall say no more, because <laughs> James might kill me. I'm, I'm talking absolute nonsense. I don't know where I, my brain was at. I think my brain was still in the Masai Mara with Malaika. It's not two males. I, I don't... I thought when I was looking at one of them, I was going, it doesn't have the little parts under its tail that I was trying to tell the kids to look for without being too graphic about it. It's a male and a female, isn't it? I'm correct about that. I had a sudden jolt of memory from when I last saw them. I'm such a... I'm such a twit. I'm sorry. I'm in complete Mara mode. And all the times that I've seen two young cheetahs together, it's been either two females or two males. I haven't actually had a mixture of a male and a female before, except in this case. Though we're still flat cat for now, we did 
spot some impala towards the west of us which is a bit worrying because it's a bit too close to the boundary for my liking that open area over there we can't see them now there were also some warthogs as well that were busy foraging in that direction so i think that once they've recovered their energy we are going to go hunting with them and i'm going to be exceedingly cautious because they are not very good at this whole hunting thing as yet they obviously have been feeding themselves they've been looking after themselves they just they haven't caught themselves a big meal in a while they've probably been surviving off baby impala and in fact if indeed their mum has disappeared it was a very opportune time for it to happen because of they were you know it was right during the impala birthing season which would have made life a little bit more difficult for them they're probably also catching scrub hairs and things like that so they'll be fine it's just going to take a little bit of work it'll be interesting to see also with a, a mixture of the two sexes how long they'll stay together sure lindsay lindsay wants to know what my favorite cheetah sighting was there were so many amazing moments i'm just trying to think there was one spectacular sighting that i had with ferg in the Maasai Mara with the five musketeers where they it was such a brilliant two days they hunted in the rain and then the lions came in and chased them away from their successful wildebeest kill but there was just water spraying everywhere it was a spectacular scene and then the next day when we went first thing in the morning to find them we had them hunting wildebeest and the way that they did it was just so fascinating but I wouldn't say that those I know what it was Hold on, never mind, scrap all of those moments. I'll give you some of my top moments, but I can tell you that the top of my list was with Craig. It was with Batman after one of those Mara storms that you actually think you may not survive. You think you might end up drowning in them. And we were with Malaika and her two boys and they started playing in the water afterwards. That was my favorite sighting when they were chasing the water ripples like dogs. I love that. So that I think was my favorite sighting. Yeah. And then I had a very brief sighting in the Mara, unfortunately now slightly spoiled, but with Kakenya when we heard that the leopard had walked through and walked through her her den site and we actually happened to be there when Kakenya came back to the den to check and see whether or not her cubs were okay and we saw the five little bundles come stumbling out of the bushes it was from very far away but i really really enjoyed that moment it was special to see them all coming out especially because i was convinced they were dead in sort of standard pessimistic way that we all adopt as our defense mechanism so that we are not unpleasantly surprised so i was convinced that they hadn't made it and then to see them all come wandering out was really lovely oh Lily that's awesome apparently the cheetah playing in the water was the first time that you ever saw me on drive that's very very cool so a nice memory to associate I mean you would have seen us tucked away in the rain covers probably slightly frazzled after that storm because it's not particularly easy to follow something in the rain like that and the roads were flowing and I knew that we had to get back home. Fortunately, where were we? We were in that ridge. I don't think we had to get through double crossing. No, we didn't because they hunted after that. And then we saw a truck go and try and go through double crossing and nearly come a cropper. Yes, that's right. Oh, memories. What else? What other cheetah sightings? I... Imani. I really enjoyed my sighting with Imani when she was playing with a rock. She kept catching rocks and throwing them up into the air with her paws. That was with Chahawi. And unfortunately wasn't live. And then we thought she was playing with a pile of elephant dung because she'd been so weird all day. It unfortunately turned out to be a baby Thompson's gazelle. The time Malika's boy tried to climb onto my bonnet that didn't happen live either by bonnet i mean the hood of my vehicle for those of you who are confused by our colloquial or by the more british english term for the front part of your car 
and I had to shout at him. Didn't spend that much time with Naratoy, honestly. I remember her cubs when they were tiny. That was quite special with Adrian on his interview drive. What other moments with Cheetah have I really, really enjoyed? To be honest, it's often in Amara, just finding them and knowing that you were not going to spend the next 10 hours driving round. Oh, that's right. Kirst has reminded me of Malaika's kill, where she caught something in the middle of double crossing. And she caught an impala and the buffalo came in. And it all happened and unfolded so quickly in the rain that I actually thought that they got her. But in reality, they'd hooked their horns underneath the buffalo carc I mean, the impala carcass, and turned it, flipped it up into the air, and it did a full turn before thumping back down. And for one heart-stopping second, I thought it was a cheetah. That's a good. That's a good one. I'll never forget the last time I saw Malaika. It was the very last night of before our last episode of the binge series in February last year and we were up all night with her about 10 o'clock at night and she sat on the boundary for about two hours between us and the conservancy where we couldn't go and then she gave me one last almost I might have said derisive look flicked her tail and off she went and leaving us with absolutely zip for the entire night when anticipating having to drive around for the rest of the night trying to find something. As it happened, we found those brand new little Marsh Pride Lion Cubs the next morning. Time feels like it's gone very fast, but as soon as I start looking back on individual sightings like that, it's actually quite extraordinary how much water under the bridge has passed amazing okay well trust i've found my spotted cat purely by chance i hope that by applying your skill you might have some success with yours well i'm glad that you did jamie i i think i have something against those spotted cats i must have like a repellent against cheetah because every time i look for them they are never around and even when i was in the mara i had so few sightings of them in fact, I think I saw at one point there was, when I first kind of went up, I'd seen more leopards than cheetah at one point, which is a bit scary in the Mara. So obviously don't do well with those spotted cats, but I'm glad Jamie's found them. Very, very good. Now our search for Hosanna is improving to be an incredibly frustrating one because we found his tracks and, and kind of picked them up from where we left them and we followed them through and we got to a junction and that junction is a road that is hardly ever driven so it's kind of covered by grass and has very little in the way of kind of car traffic and so it's rock rock hard rain and kind of dissolve into it I, I mean i it's almost impossible i looked and looked and looked and walked on foot for a bit couldn't find anything i wanted to come to this little quarry because this is a quarry where leopards often will come drink when it's got water in it you can see there's a buffalo skull that's inside yeah this was from i don't remember which part i think sticks sticks killed this in 2016 i think was the time they killed it um but that's an old old buffalo you can see by the number of horn boring moths that are on there that there's been here for quite some time but this little pan often attracts the likes of Hosanna, Tandi, Klalamba. In fact we're right between where Tandi and Klalamba and Hosanna had those kills and um, this is exactly where it is and his tracks kind of head in a sort of southeasterly direction um, and so I'm sure he's here somewhere it's just a matter of finding him but it's so hot and humid and kind of close in the air that I can't imagine any cat is moving too much in this kind of temperature it really is quite uncomfortable and if you are um, covered in fur I would imagine you wouldn't be too happy so we're gonna just keep looking I'm, I'm hoping that he is around we'll also sit and turn off for a bit maybe we get an alarm call while we do that though back up to James who has found a beefy buffalo for all of you well here are two of the largest ungulates found in Africa the elant and the beefalo now the beefalo of course are favoured prey of the sausage tree pride and indeed many lions in the area and 
I'm not sure why the Elant are hanging around with them, but this is the direction from which that other vehicle came. And it is also quite interesting to see that the beefalo do not exactly look like they are on a Sunday afternoon picnic. They look a little bit distressed. And I don't know why we should have caused that, so perhaps there is something else around here that has given them stress. Uh, and I, by that I, of course, mean the lions, don't I? It is absolutely magnificent suddenly out here. I'm just taking a picture of a fig tree because I thought maybe the lions were underneath it, but they are not. Let's just listen for a little while. <coughs> Excuse me. I do apologize. That must have sounded horrible. Anyway, apart from my sneezing, there's very little sound. Just a few doves and a few birds up on the trees on the slopes of the Olalolo escarpment and apparently I am now the only one on drive who has yet to have cat luck. Well, we have been searching and we have been looking and we exactly what we're looking for but very very close because they're peering through the thicket is Kuchava. Now this is a surprise I didn't expect to have in this area. Well, this is exactly where Tandi and Kalamba were sitting the other night when we did our TV show on Sunday and so for her to kind of be here is quite interesting and it's exactly where kind of I thought Hosanna's tracks were going to come out so when we were driving along and I saw a tail I thought for a second it was Hosanna but it is Kuchava that's there. Look how she's sniffing. So she's trying to work out who has been here, which leopards have been around. At the end of the day, Hosanna was here, Tandi was here, Klalamba was here. So a lot of scent that she's going to have. Now, if you look at her tummy, you'll see that there's a little bit of kind of sagging there and a little bit of fur that's missing. And so that's because she has had cubs recently. And so it looks potentially like she's still suckling. I'm just trying to see nicely. It looks like there's still milk there. Now, no one's had a sighting of her cubs in quite some time. Girl, are you going to take us to her, your cubs? Wouldn't that be special this afternoon if she took us to cubs? But anyway, she's on a mission and she's crossing into Torchwood, which is wonderful news, but she's heading in a direction that allows us to be able to follow her. And I'm so glad that we gambled to come to Torchwood today because I wasn't sure about it. And obviously with Signal and, and various other issues that we have, um, on Torchwood, it's always a bit tricky. And luckily, Hosanna's tracks led us to this. Now, Jasmine, you say your first time to see Kuchava. She's a beautiful girl, so I'm glad that you've gotten to see her. She really is very, very pretty. And of course, she's a special cat in that she's part of the Karula lineage. And so as much as Hosanna and Tandi and Klalamba, I mean, she's just one of the older daughters of Tandi. And so it's very important that she's around. Look, she's scent marking. So what she's going to do is she's going to mark her territory all over here because if Tandi has been here, she's going to want to send a message to Tandi to say, listen, um, this is my territory, mom. You are not welcome to keep pushing this far south and across. And so very cool to see her. And, and like I say, it does look like there's still milk there. So I wonder where the cubs are, whether they're this side or they are on Chitwa, it's or Cheetah Plains or Annette's. It's one of those properties that she's on. I have a sneaky suspicion they're not here. Just given how much time Tandi and Klalamba have been spending on Torchwood, I'd be very shocked if she was um, keeping cubs on this side. I have a funny feeling they're to the south and she's just doing a routine northern patrol at this stage. But either way, this is very special to see her again. It's been a long time since I've got to spend a lot of time with her. Obviously the other day, Molly and I had her, we heard her calling while we were sitting with Hosanna and um, managed to kind of catch up with her. But it was a brief sighting. It, unfortunately, we lost signal and we couldn't really follow her for a long period. But it seems as though if we look for Hosanna in Torchwood and around this area, we tend to have a bit of luck with her, which is wonderful. Now, the problem is that she's actually starting to head back south a little bit, which is not what we want. We want her to head back northwards. She looks as though she's marking quite a bit. I'm pretty sure she can pick up the scent of Tandi. 
Indeed, Andy. So you've noticed that she looks a little bit like Mvula. She does, doesn't she? She's got a very kind of Mvula look to her. So she, that would have been in the period when Mvula was still kind of uh, on the edge of dominance. I mean, he was starting to slowly but surely kind of lose out to Tingana, but he was still dominant at that stage. Now, where does she go? There she is. Yeah got her that's fine as long as we just keep view of her so this, our, the only problem is is if she keeps mo kind of moving the way that she is very quickly we're going to probably lose her into hmm, I'm just trying to think where she's gonna go she might go and drink at this very puddle that I was talking about just now the quarry that I was telling you about she's heading directly towards it um, so you know, I was saying if we're going to lose her if she keeps heading straight west the way that she is at the moment because that goes into kind of the boundary between us, Torchwood, Little Gari and Chitwa. And so while we can traverse three of the four properties, there's obviously one that we can't. And knowing the likes of some of these cats, they can sometimes choose the ones that are more tricky for us. And there she comes. Hello, my girl. Oh, it's nice to see you. Where are your little ones? Hmm? I wonder if she's going to sniff all around here where Hosanna and Tandi and Tlalamba were. Isn't she pretty? Look at that. Now she's going to walk right behind Seb. She's coming to say hello to Sebastian because he hasn't seen a leopard in the new year. Yeah. So he's very happy today because now he's got a sighting of this beautiful little cat. And I say little, she's typical kind of size like Tandi um, in many respects is quite small and kind of petite. Um, but has that same little kind of aggressive factor to her than what Tandy does. Now I'm just going to reposition for Seb because it can't be very comfortable the way that he was. So we're just going to go forward a little bit. There we go, Seb. Now look at her Fleming grimacing. So now Noriko, uh, the father of her current cubs, uh, difficult to know for sure. We think potentially there's a toss up between quarantine and this unknown male that Taylor had. Um, he's been seen quite a lot on little gallery and vessels and um, so it could be him or like I say it could be quarantine so it's an interesting kind of thing but you can see how she's Fleming grimacing so she's picking up the scent and trying to work out who exactly has been moving around here and the answer is your mom and her new little cub so your sister and I suppose your stepbrother in many respects or your uncle I don't know how it actually do that your step uncle is probably the way you can actually hear her sniffing very very gently for us so you guys might not be able to hear it but look at that look how she's smelling she's very very intrigued by this scent see how she's still flim and grimacing are you not happy, my girl, that there has been an intruder here? And I'm still intrigued to know where the divide between these two are in terms of the territory within Torchwood. Um, you know, we haven't really had enough time to explore Torchwood enough to know exactly how far Kachava pushes north. And the thing is, if she's had cubs that have been newborn, she's been spending most of her time then where those cubs have been born, and she'll be hunting very close to those areas. She won't range too far. Remember when we had Tandi around with Klalamba? We used to find Tandi quite regularly, quite close by. I mean, she never really ventured too far from where the cubs are. And maybe this is now the first time that she's actually starting to really kind of venture northwards. And it's going to be interesting to see how Tandi and her kind of figure out that boundary once again, because we know Kuchava at one point was even pushing into the sort of south eastern corner of Juma when she had that interaction with Tandi and Tingana and the Avoka boys when Sydney first arrived. Um, and since then she hasn't really been seen there so it's going to be interesting to see whether there's a pushback from her now as her cubs start to get a little bit older and a little bit bigger and she starts to move a lot more. It's going to be very intriguing to see how she goes about her business. But isn't she pretty? She's a beautiful, beautiful female and in prime condition. Ooh, Seb, I think let's get around a little bit, see if we can get her face. So, Rod, possibly, I mean, if 
Tandy, we know Tandy can be a little bit grumpy sometimes, and so she could potentially pose a small threat. Oh, you're going to lie down. Hold on, Seb, let's get to the other side. Um, she could potentially pose a threat, but in all likelihood, um, no. As you, you know, Kochava would be quite defensive, and between the two of them, they would probably try their very best to kind of settle it away from the cubs and keep the cubs at bay. But oh, look at that, kind of framed by the two sides of the mound absolutely beautiful if you ask me well i think so anyway and she's looking as pretty as one could ever want kind of framed by the termite mound itself um so no i don't think tandy would be too much of a threat i mean tandy would also have to push quite far south the, where the cubs were first seen was in a property called a nets now a nets is an area that is south of chitwa and we're on the northern side of chitwa granted chitwa is not the biggest property um is is true but you know it would it would mean that tandy would have had to have gone a long 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 way to the south to be able to do that and since her run in with sabui i'm not sure she would really want to kind of engage in that behavior and go that way and so i think for now the chances of that run in is probably quite slim unless of course kuchava pushes far north with little um with her cubs and Tandy hangs around here and, and especially if she's going to leave Tlalumba somewhere and start to utilize this area more then we might start to see a little bit of interaction between them but they'll try and kind of direct the attention away from the cubs and all more onto themselves um, to keep them safe and so I think they'll be okay I mean I hope that you know that they'd be all right even though she's a daughter of Tandy there's still that kind of aggressive factor in terms of this is my space my land I don't want you to be too close Right, now from one spotted cat to another, let's send you back across to Jamie. Well done, Trist. Very good job in terms of finding Kuchava. That's really awesome news. I can't think when last I actually saw Kuchava. I'm a bit distracted. Are you okay there, Craig? Mm. Shame. Craig just sliced open his knee on the bottom of the camera pedestal so I'm just checking to see that he's not actually bleeding to death in the back it looks as though he's going to survive comes as a great relief to all of us shame these cars bite the number of injuries one acquires and I've spent quite a lot of time sitting on the back recently um, the number of injuries one acquires from the, the pedestal is quite extraordinary there's a sort of permanent set of bruises in specific places our cheetah haven't moved very much, although you saw the one obviously rolled over. I'm trying to think when last I saw Kuchaba. And it must have been on Cheetah Plains. Because I don't think I've seen her since I got back from Amara. It must have been that long ago. I can't believe it. I hope... Maybe, you never know, maybe Tristan will get really lucky and you'll actually get to see her cubs today. Wouldn't that be something extraordinary? Uh, there's a the little boy, lying relaxed in the soft green grass. Must be so nice, no longer having to lie on the scratchy dirt. Ah, Mrs. Lapwing, a wonderful question about what the cheetah population is like in the surrounding area. Apparently in the Greater Kruger, it's around about 2,000 individuals. Uh, that number really is difficult to know for absolute certain whether or not that is 100% accurate. It's the largest, supposedly the largest metapopulation in the world of a cheetah is here in the Greater Kruger. We... Sorry, I was just listening to where Kuchava actually was because I could hear Tristan calling it in. I was just curious. Um, what did I talk about? Oh, yes, populations. You'd think that it would be the highest population would be somewhere like the Serengeti and the Masai Mara. But apparently that's not the case. I'm not sure how old that study was, though, that actually got the breakdown of numbers in terms of how many cheetah are where. We think that cheetah really like open areas. They like openish areas, but some of you would have read the article from Femka, who was 
Reece, up until recently in charge of the Mara Predator Project, she spent her life dedicated to cheetah research. And it's very clear, and it's something that I've observed throughout my time guiding and watching cheetah, but, uh, you know, I've never really had much evidence for, that cheetah do like mixed woodland. In other words, they like to have a little bit of cover. It's very, very difficult for them to actually sneak up all the way to their prey in a fully open area. They're agile enough that they can dodge and duck and dive trees, so they're not really in, you know, it's really not hampering them that much. And if it hampers them, it'll hamper their prey as well. And it also gives them suitable hiding places for their cubs. So it's shown, the study shows that it's actually they're more successful in areas where there is a little bit of cover from trees. So you've got to be careful of assuming that open areas are best for cheetahs. They do like clearings, and you will find them where the vegetation is a little bit more sparse. It's not like a leopard where, you know, a drainage line is their preferred hunting habitat. But they do definitely prefer to move around in slightly open woodland. I've also, I mean, I followed two pairs of male cheetah way back when, uh, Songo and Sanana and Babalo and Nasedi. And both of them really liked, both sets of cheetah really enjoyed spending time along the rocky areas, which is not what you'd expect because you'd think it would actually do damage to their ankles and their wrists while they're running at high speed. Another thing a cheetah loves, uh, whether or not we want to admit it, is a fence. Cheetahs love fence lines. They chase their prey into the fences. It, of course, gives them an unnatural advantage, which in South Africa is, you know, there's nothing we can do about that because there are fences. So the, we fence in our reserves, where in the Mara, of course, they don't have that. But cheetah love a fence line. And if you ever find yourself trying to look for them, often if you're on a reserve where there is a fence line, that's the best place to start. thoroughly sleepy. There's a cheetah on the reserve where Brent's parents live that is 68 kilograms, 67 or 68, can't remember, with an empty stomach. It's absolutely enormous. It's the biggest cheetah I've ever seen in my entire life. When he sat up, I was taken aback. Okay, in a strange twist of events, we have Cheetah on Juma, and of course Tristan has his leopard, and now let's go and see what James has in store for us. And we have a lot of grass here in the Masai Mara, a couple of trees, one or two birds, lots of cloud, but no lions. Hang on a second. I think it's probably just some bush. Uh, I, know, I know it is. I know it's some lion-coloured bush. And I'm still going to look at it. I'm looking at it now. It is lion-coloured bush. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. We are doing our best, I promise. It's a gorgeous afternoon. We just need the sausages. Come back to see them. You'd think they'd have bothered to show themselves. We've searched all their old haunts. As Bungay was saying though, you know, the grass has got so long. Hmm. Look. Now, well, you're wondering about the Black Rock Pride and an update on them. I'm afraid I've got absolutely no idea what's happened to them. And I haven't had for some time. I'm afraid. And that is simply because we do not hang around them anymore. Isn't that beautiful? Little reed buck. If I'm desperately mistaken, I'm pretty sure it was a reed buck. <laughs> well, I tend to lose my mind from time to time. Beautiful. Now let's just listen. They of course make an astonishing call when they see nasty things that might try and eat them. 
and it's a whistle. A bizarre sort of whistle. I wonder, however, if they are going to whistle for us. I, I fear they are not. It really is gorgeous, isn't it? So peaceful. Lots of flies. I must say, there have been a lot of flies around on the animals here in the Mara. David was talking about it yesterday. And of course, it made sense on the lions because they've often got the bits of viscera from their uh, latest kill or. I suppose salt from a bit of sweat. They don't really sweat, so but I'm sure their skin does give off a bit of moisture. But for a reed buck like that, I don't know. Maybe it also has a bit of dirt on its face. All right, let's leave the reed buck making its whistle and go on. See if we can find them cats. Don't worry, we're just passing by. If you're not, stay where you are. <laughs> Just watching us go. Now, we think that Kinky Tail and the rest of the lionesses are around here in this drainage line or in this gully. But we just haven't found them. Sean, no, our traversing has not changed for the last, oh, 18, not 18 months. We are almost 18 months. We've been operating only in the Mara Triangle for around about the last 14, 14 to 18 months. And we haven't been operating across the river. So we've had the 150 or the 50,000 hectares here, or what is that again? 150,000 acres odd in this area. Well, not quite that, 120,000 acres. And then the other side of the river on the Masai Mara National Reserve, we haven't traversed the whole of last year and a little bit before. So, no, it hasn't been restricted for a long time. But I mean, the Black Rock Pride we saw a long, long time ago. All right, we'll continue our search. Tristan and Jamie have had much more luck this afternoon, so let's go back to Guchava. Well, we're still following Kuchava. She's about to cross back into Chitwa. She's crossing behind us. Of course she would. She was going to cross in front of us towards a big mound and then all of a sudden change direction. So we had set up so that she'd come up onto the mound, which she decided she didn't want to. She would rather go that route. And so we're going to try and follow her as she goes that route. I just need to try and find a place where I can actually cross because there's quite a few branches and sticks and various other things that are all over the place at the moment. So we're going to try and just get past. Now, wouldn't it be nice if she, there's a nice big fallen over um, tree that I'm hoping she's going to go onto. Oh no, she's chosen the small one. I was hoping she was going to the big one that's right in front of us over there, but she's decided this one is the one that she wants. Oh, she's looking so beautiful. This afternoon light is also really quite special on her at the moment. And so hopefully she'll continue to pose throughout the evening. So Ravinda, if Hosanna becomes dominant and territorial within an area she inhabits, then yes, she will mate with him. Um, it does happen from time to time, and even though they are related, it's not the end of the world. Uh, it takes quite a lot of inbreeding before there's a negative effect on cats. She's going to go onto that mound, isn't she? I mean, onto that fallen over stump, is she? Come on, girl. Hop up. No, she's just going to urinate next to it. So I was hoping she was going to go up, but there you can see the little candy cane tail behind that, and onward she goes. But Hosanna will mate with her. It's its only instinct for them to, when they see a, a female in estrus, to try and follow her and try and mate with her. Um, and so it wouldn't be surprised if he did. But like I said, it's, it's only if 
He had to mate with her, then her daughter, then her daughter, then the other daughter, and then you, you would start to see kind of a bit of a degradation in the, the genetic material of these particular cats. And so for now, it's okay. I mean, one sort of lineage or one um, litter wouldn't really be too much of a train smash. And also they have got different fathers um, or different males that potentially have mated to to allow them to exist. And so, you know, that means that they theoretically should be fine. Are you going to go up onto the big mound? Oof, I don't know if she will. It's so hot this afternoon. It's gotten really kind of humid and close and sticky. It's horrible kind of weather. It needs a bit of a storm to break, but we actually are predicted to have a massive, massive deluge, apparently, um, come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they're predicting over 300 millimeters of rain. Now, 300 millimeters of rain is more than we've had annually for the last sort of, I would say, what, two, three years almost? So we've kind of been having such a dry period. Isn't that spectacular though? How wonderful is that? I think it's absolutely perfect. Female leopard against a blue sky on top of a mound, the sun starting to slowly kind of edge out and show itself. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, I think so anyway. I know some people might not agree, but I do. The only thing that's really kind of destroying this whole view is that grass that is in front of her face. So if that wasn't there, this would be the most perfect view of a leopard up on its mound. But She's probably going to watch out over Chitwa Dam's open area. She's probably looking for any signs of potential prey animals that she can maybe hunt. Seb, I'm going to try one more spot here because it looks like there might be a little gap where she's facing. Now, of course, she might face in different directions, but I think there might be a little gap through the grass where she can look kind of over the top of us and we don't have to worry about grass in her face. Am I right or am I wrong? I th think I'm kind of right. We're good there, Seb. Beautiful blue sky in the background, that's for sure. And a little bit of side lighting on her. Of course, she'll face the other way. This is how leopards are. They'll face the way that you are not in. And I was trying to get that gap there, but there's a bit more grass than I thought. And this is the problem with the summer is that you start to get these grasses that grow on the mounds. Anna Marie, you say an iconic view. Indeed, it really is very, very pretty when you have kind of leopards on big mounds like this. It is that kind of iconic feel to them and um, I always enjoy when I see a leopard on a particularly on a mound like this where it's it's very tall and you've got a beautiful summer sky in the background greenery so those greens and blues and their golden coats really just kind of pops out from those colorations so it's always nice when you've got that hello my girl it's amazing how much she looks like Mvula she's got that very kind of boxy face and then those big ears which is a trait of a lot of Karula's lineage so I mean, we've seen it with Tamba, he had, well, not Karula's lineage, should I say, um, Tandi's lineage. We've seen it with Karula, um, Waba Yiza, and Karula. Monique, do I have a vendetta with grass and twigs at the moment? I, well, I feel like they've got a vendetta against me because every time we try and get an animal into frame, there will be a grass or a twig in the way. Um, it's a piece or blade of grass, should I say? Um, and so, yes, I, I suppose there is a bit of a vendetta at the moment. I, it's also because it takes some time to get used to the fact that we have grass again. Remember, we've had a few dry years, and you kind of forget when you go through a winter period when it's been dry that grass exists and that it does get in the way. Um, and then when summer comes along, it's kind of this internal fight that you have to remember oh, yes, actually, there is grass that grows and it does get long and it does get in the way and it is irritating, but it's okay because the animals will need it at some point and they will eat it so yes I suppose I do a little bit it, it, it ruins our cinema cinemat oh, I can't cinematography. even get it there we go cinematography mm -hmm. yes that well that was cool was it Hosanna wasn't it Tlalamba we did make a leaf moustache for Tlalamba it was Tlalamba she had the little Fu Manchu leaf moustache which was highly entertaining well I found it highly entertaining I had a good chuckle um when we did that to her. But there we go, she's now obliging. Doesn't she look like a little princess on her throne up there? I think she looks really good. And you can see that she is Tandi's offspring. I know she doesn't look quite like Tandi, she looks more like Mbula, but there is that kind of, I don't know, Tandi-ish offspring look about her. Like I say, the big ears is probably the biggest giveaway of it all. But 
you can see she's also hot now that that sun's starting to just peek out again the humidity is crazy Seb are you hot uh, Seb is panting like Kuchava at the moment as well he's saying he's also hot it's nice when you're moving because you get a bit of a breeze but when you sit still it feels like you're being wrapped in a blanket at the moment um, so quite warm and she's obviously feeling those effects as well and she really is wrapped in a blanket in that she's got a thick fur coat that we don't even have so I can't imagine how she must be feeling in comparison to us I'm hoping though that she's gonna settle up there and eventually just get herself nice and kind of relaxed and sit on top of the mound and, and take it very easy um, it looks like she's gonna start grooming and that's typically a sign that she's getting ready just to have a bit of a kind of nap or just take it easy on top especially if she's been walking quite a bit good now she's taking it easy now it sounds like Jamie's cheetah are doing much the same and so it's that time of the afternoon we have a hiatus but we'll send you across in case they do decide to wake up they're very much doing exactly the same they are taking it very easy quite relaxed gives us an opportunity to have a look at their spots for those of you that are perhaps unfamiliar with this pair nice chance for you and I to have a look for things that stand out like two spots on the top of the left ear is a nice little one as a mar as markings go for this little boy now, ideally of course when you're identifying cheetah what you really need is the profile rather than their back but you know if on the off chance that you were to see the back of this cheetah again you would if you were to take a screenshot you would be able to then identify it in the future. So, you know, if those of you that are new to these live safaris, each and every single cheetah has a unique set of spots, like a fingerprint. So, unlike leopards, it's quite difficult to identify them with the whisker spot pattern. Although, to be honest with leopards, I never use the whisker spot pattern anyway. The way that my brain works is to look for obvious identifying standout features on the leopards. The leopards have got so easy now because we actually recognize their faces. It's only when we're dealing with unknown leopards that we start to look closely at those spot patterns. And these cheetah I haven't had a chance to get to know yet. It was just an easy jump to work out who they were. Where's the second one gone? Is it that flat? I suddenly realized I can't see it. It must be, maybe it's sitting up. Oh, wow. That is very flat. Okay, well, for now, our cheetah are resting up and apparently Kuchava has changed her mind. She's not lying down anymore. She spotted something. Let's go see if she's successful. Well, as you can see, she's caught a warthog, so she's got a piglet. Now we're gonna try and kind of make a plan to get somewhere. We unfortunately can't drive too close to Chitwa camp, but she's definitely got a piglet. The way it's squealing, says that she's caught one so we're gonna try and catch up she just went running off of a mound now we're gonna try and get in here where's the warthog there's the warthog I can't see where she is at the moment the warthogs will charge her and try and get her can you see her Seb saw the warthog warthog where's she gone now that was just chaos she just started kind of coming off the mound and then running with full speed into this area now there the two warthogs are running but there was squealing so she definitely got hold of one, and I saw her chasing a piglet, not a little adult. Oh, yes, yes, she's got the piglet in the tree, Seb. So she got the piglet in the tree. Now, the piglet's still kicking, so if you are sensitive, then probably now is a good time to look away. There you can see it's just doing its last little kicks. So she spotted that from the mound. She was about to fall asleep, and then she just darted off, and we couldn't even keep up with her, and she managed to grab this warthog. How crazy is that? And her attacking style that she did this, you know, normally leopards are slow hunters and they'll stalk up, but she saw the piglets and she just ran in there between all of the warthogs, grabbed it and went up into the tree. That was absolutely insane. Wow. Seb, how was that? <laughs> Seb always gets the lucky stuff. Right, now I'm just going to try and position so we can actually now like I say if you are a little bit squeamish and you don't want to see a little baby in the mouth of a leopard then there we go 
Now, Weepy, you say that was so fast. Well, it just goes to show you how opportunistic leopards can be. They will find a chance, they'll get into it very quickly, and they'll try and grab it. And the reason she's up the tree is because the adult warthogs chased her up there. So they found her, they saw her, and they tried to chase her, and she went up the tree for safety. That little piglet is so light that she can get it up, and she doesn't actually have to worry too much about kind of getting herself... Um, into fighting mode with adult warthogs because that inevitably is very very dangerous for her so wow that was very very special we got fortunate there but it happened so fast it was crazy she was sleeping and then all of a sudden she ran and then we caught up with her and we thought no we'll be have some time um to be able to kind of see her stalk because we saw the warthogs we lined up a shot and then she just raced off as you guys were linking and she managed to grab this little one and the only reason we knew she grabbed it is because of that squealing well done girl yes well done she's looking right at us as if to say look at me i've got myself some bacon and so there she's got a tiny little warthog now as much as it's sad for the warthog obviously for her she's got cubs to feed and so these little meals like this are vitally important for her and so you do have to feel sorry for a little piglet and it's always traumatic i think watching warthogs being hunted because they squeal so much but essentially it's a soft target for her at the moment something that she can really kind of eat and it's funny because i can't remember well, not funny but it's a, I, the word i'm looking for is strange probably or coincidence that this one was caught because who was it it was david yes david was telling me that they've been filming warthogs at chitwa dam recently that have been very relaxed and they obviously this must be those warthogs because they took off well she took off after them and the warthogs didn't run away from us and she managed to grab it now in terms of where we are from chitwa the camp is right here so we're right near the camp it's just across from this tree so there it is just behind those trees there is where the camp is you can see the antennas where we get our signal on for chitwa and that's the main kind of lodge over there so she's right in front of camp at the moment and like i say we can't actually off-road beyond this tree line on the big open area so this is okay where we are but they're trying to let the grass recover because it was so badly damaged during the drought now seb do you want me to try to get forward because i've got a bit of a better gap than what you've got there you've got something covering her eye and i think i can get you into a spot where it's a little bit better so there we go wow well that happened out of absolutely nowhere kuchava well done girl that was quite something i did not expect that at all it was a tactic that you see from male leopards a lot more than you see from female leopards and she's brave to go and try and tangle with warthogs i mean obviously it's a piglet but a adult warthog can be incredibly dangerous um, to a leopard and she's lucky that she caught it as close as she did to a tree and that it's as light as it is because she could pick it up and just run straight in and actually finish the job up in there and what she would have done is she's not killing that warthog piglet like you would see most animals being killed what she's doing is she's not got it by the throat she's got it by the back and the power of her jaws as she's biting there is probably in all likelihood breaking that piglet's spine and there's obviously big puncture wounds you can see the blood that's dripping down from its neck that is basically probably in all likelihood broken its neck and she can now kind of get into a nice spot in order to feed but wow that was quite something right seb let's get into another position here amazing seb says well seb seb was saying that he hasn't seen much in the way of leopard and well that's quite a leopard sighting to start your year with seb if you get any leopard sightings like that through the course of the year you're going to be very 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 spoiled anyway we're going to sit with her for a while longer in the meantime let's send you back across to Jamie and the cheetahs, and I wonder if they're going to be lucky like Kuchaba. Absolutely. Um, very well done to Tristan. What an awesome thing for Seb. Now, the reason you're with me and with reclining cheetah is that we have, well, we have plans. We have plans in order to show you the brief bit of what we missed. So don't panic. Don't send final control nasty messages because you're with us instead of Tristan watching Kuchava and the piglet. It's actually because we've got something planned for you. And right now our cheetah are really thoroughly snoozing, although as Kuchava's just taught us, things can change in the blink of an eye. Still no sign of those Impala, I can't see them. 
I think they're probably a little bit wary because they would have heard the alarm calls from the Impala that were being chased earlier. And we're just waiting to see what transpires. I think we're getting to the point now, really very soon, where these cheetah are going to get up and start hunting. It's around about at that time. Be interesting to know just how much hunting these guys do as it gets dark or after dark. I think it's safe to assume that it's a great deal less. Sinak, you want to know if I've seen cheetahs chasing baby warthog? I have. I have even seen cheetah catch baby warthog in the Mara, in the case of the five cheetah brothers. Unfortunately, it was in an area where, I think if I remember correctly, we didn't have any signal. It was one of those drives where things just kept going wrong and we just didn't have any signal. So, unfortunately, we weren't able to broadcast it. But yes, I have. Typically, young cheetah or female cheetah will avoid warthogs like that. Just simply because the mother actually poses them a really serious threat. And an injury to a cheetah's leg, well, will essentially mean death for that poor cheetah because they are unable to hunt and unable to provide for themselves. So they are reticent when, when we're talking about female cheetah to approach warthogs. It does still happen though. So just like m with any individual cat, there are certain animals that have a sort of specialization in types of prey. Tingana, for example, loves to catch warthogs. Uh, look, I mean, how much of a specialization that is really, we're not not fully confident to say, because he also catches Impala and Inyala and all sorts of other things. But there are some cheetah who are more likely to go for warthogs than others. And obviously when you're dealing with male cheetah with the advantage of numbers, then they're also more likely to do so. Baby warthogs are a tasty snack for pretty much anything out here. Poor little things. It's a big, wide, very scary world for a baby warthog. Basically a cocktail sausage, an appetizer. Although for Kachava, an important meal if she's looking after little cubs and producing milk for them. The little boy is still glancing off in around him, looking to see whether or not there's something approaching. They're going to have to use the thickets if they're going to sneak up on anything here. It's very open. Oh, there we go. Quick roll over and a stretch. Checking out in the direction that we saw those impala. And getting comfortable again. Alrighty, we are finished up with our preparations, or at least final controllers. We're going to bounce you back onto Tristan's vehicle so he can tell you exactly what played out. Well, we are. I mean, it's obviously, it was a very quick thing. I was just saying to Seb, now we watched it back because Seb was recording while we were actually watching it. And it happened much faster than it felt, and well, it felt much faster. Well, the clip went much faster than it felt like. The hunt felt like a little bit longer. But anyway, we do have a clip. It doesn't have sound. It's something that we recorded quickly off the vehicle, so hopefully you'll enjoy the kind of chase that happened. that so did you see how she just bombed in there and that's why I said it wasn't a typical leopard hunt at all generally what you see with Kuchava or with any leopard is a slow stalk up calculating watching but she just went straight for that piglet she didn't care about the adults the adults scattered and you saw how she just chased that piglet through the thickets and it's a pity it got so thick because otherwise I think we would have been able to follow that track all the way through where we would have seen her grab it and go up into the tree but how incredible was that in a display of hunting prowess from one of Karula's lineage. Now, like I say, it's always sad when you see a little warthog being killed or any baby animal being killed. But remember that in order for her to be able to feed her babies, she needs
happens to target certain animals. And at this time of the year, this is going to be the easiest thing for her. She can eat this. She can get really good quality food inside her body that's going to keep her stronger. Um, and that's going to allow her to protect her territory and allow her to um, keep her babies as safe as possible. In terms of food, it doesn't really play too much of a part in um, providing better quality milk. Um, the body of a cat will generally metabolize itself, basically eats itself to provide nutrient rich milk for the little ones. So you'll find that even when they don't feed very well, they still provide fairly decent milk um, for their kittens um, or their cubs, depending on what um, cat they are. And so, you know, it's not really that side of it. It's more that it keeps her body in good condition and that keeps her allowing to find food and find things for those cubs as they grow up and protect them. So vitally important for her, but very, 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 very crazy. Well, I don't even know what the word is for it. I, I wouldn't have expected that in these conditions, this heat, I wouldn't have thought she would have run and grabbed a warthog and pull it up into the tree. Now, a lot of you are wow. I think it's a perfect time for a one word tweet. What did that hunt? What do you think about that hunt? I think it was just incredible. That's my one word. So you guys can tell me what your one word tweet is for that hunt. Crazy. Who would have thought? I wonder if Hassan is going to arrive with squealing like that. You never know who's around. It might very well be that little fat cat also arrives in this area. Now, Joy, you say your one word is survival. Well, yes, survival for the leopard, but not so much for the little piglet, I'm afraid. It didn't really have much of a chance. Once Kuchava locked eyes on her, she was not going to let that go. And she was just going to run in there and grab it. And that's the, the advantage that she has over the cheetah that Jamie's with, is the cheetah would have probably been in all likelihood chased off by those adult warthogs. But she has the advantage of going up into a tree and that allows her then to be able to kind of um, get to safety to actually finish the, the kill and to keep that warthog from um, escaping because if she starts to, to fight with the adults she'll have to drop it to try and kind of defend herself and it's different Sharon I agree with you explosive was exactly what happened there it was insane it was kind of wild dog and then it was a leopard hunt but I have seen leopards do this before like I say male leopards though very, I've, this is the first time I've seen female leopards hunt like that with warthogs they generally are quite shy of big adult warthogs I've seen male leopards do this quite commonly and Kashan male used to do it regularly um, you know Mvula to a degree Mufufan used to do it quite a lot um, and Tinga I've seen him go after little piglets too like that um, so you know there was there's more males who was around um, he used to do it as well. So, you know, it's, it's the bigger males typically will hunt in that fashion where they just kind of push in, they just don't care. They come in with force and they try and kind of bully that, um, that animal off, off uh, its babies and then take the babies and get up into a tree or a mouth. But, whew, that was crazy. Right, now I believe we're getting a bit of breakup. That's just unfortunate right behind you but this is wild it's thick it's irritated it's the break part and parcel of these kind of things but start feeding in typical from the beast um so you can start kind of eating from the tail area um the leg and, and try and eat it forward from i think her cubs are still too young for 